Hi everyone, today we will talk more about geodesics and the relationship with curvature. Let's start by reviewing a theorem we discussed last time, which says that if we take a point P in a surface sigma and a parametrization phi in such a way that phi of 0 equals P, then there is an open set A in R4 containing 0 and a positive number epsilon with the property that for any u v a b in A, there is a geodesic defined on the interval minus epsilon epsilon with initial position phi of u v and initial velocity a phi u plus b phi v, and the point gamma u v a b t depends smoothly on all five variables u v a b and t. Recall that the exponential map is defined as follows. For v in tp sigma, take the geodesic with initial position p and initial velocity v and define x of v to be that geodesic evaluated at time 1. A consequence of this theorem is that there is a ball v in tp sigma centered at 0, for which the exponential map is defined, is smooth and its derivative at 0 is the identity, so by the inverse function theorem it is a parametrization if the ball is small enough. Call it s. This parametrization induces polar coordinates r theta, where r denotes the distance to the origin, while theta denotes the angle with respect to a fixed direction in tp sigma. These coordinates induce vector fields s r and s theta on the image of v minus p. Notice that since geodesics have constant speed, the length of s r is 1 whenever it is defined. First thing we proved today is the Gauss lemma, which states that these two vector fields are orthogonal. To prove it, use the product rule to deduce from the fact that SR dot SR is constant that SR theta is orthogonal to SR. Then the derivative with respect to R of the dot product between SR and S theta is the product between SRR and S theta plus the product between SR and S theta R. From the fact that the theta lines are geodesics, the first term is zero, and from our above observation, the second term is also zero. This implies that the product SR times S theta does not depend on R. Finally, we know that the limit of S theta as R goes to zero is zero, so the product SR times S theta is zero for all R. The Gauss lemma motivates the following definition. We say that a parametrization S is a semi-geodesic chart if for each fixed V, the map that sends U to S U V is a unit speed geodesic and at each point the vectors S U and S V are perpendicular. Because of the Gauss lemma, we know that there are plenty of semi-geodesic charts. It is then not hard to check that any point in a surface can be covered by a semi-geodesic chart. Note that this is not trivial from the Gauss lemma, as ironically, a semi-geodesic chart around P does not cover P. To solve this exercise, one needs to find a point Q near P, such that P is covered by the semi-geodesic chart around Q. This can be done using the theorem mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. Now we check that minimizing curves are geodesics, and conversely, any geodesic is locally a minimizing curve. To prove the first implication, we take a minimizing curve parameterized by arc length, gamma, and sigma. We need to prove that it is a geodesic. Since being a geodesic is a local condition, and any restriction of a minimizing curve to a smaller domain is also a minimizing curve, we can assume the curve gamma is short enough so that it can be written as s of rt, comma, theta t in polar coordinates around gamma of zero. Assume for now that gamma is a smooth curve. Then gamma prime is given by r prime sr plus theta prime s theta. Since the length of gamma is given by the integral from 0 to L of the length of gamma prime, by the Gauss lemma and the Pythagoras theorem, it is greater or equal than the integral of r prime, which equals r of L. Notice also that the curve alpha given by alpha of t equals s of t comma theta of L has length precisely r of L and has the same endpoints as gamma. Since gamma was minimizing, its length is less or equal to the one of alpha, so the inequalities in the above expression are actually equalities. This can only happen if theta prime is identically zero and gamma coincides with alpha being a geodesic. To deal with the case when gamma is not necessarily smooth, 
Notice that by the Rademacher theorem, the curve gamma is differentiable almost everywhere and the above arguments hold without change. Now, to verify the other implication, take t0 and ab, and epsilon small enough so that for t in 0 to epsilon, gamma of t plus t0 minus epsilon can be written as s of t comma 0 in polar coordinates around p equals gamma of t0 minus epsilon. By the arguments from the first part, using the Gauss lemma, we see that for any r0 smaller than the radius of b, any curve beta connecting p to the circle of points with r coordinate r0 has length at least r0. In particular, any curve connecting p with gamma of t0 plus epsilon must have length at least to epsilon, showing that gamma, restricted to this short interval of length to epsilon, is a minimizing curve. This finishes the proof of the fact that motivated the introduction of geodesics in the first place. Minimizing curves are geodesics, and short geodesics are minimizing curves. Now we begin to study the relationship between the behavior of geodesics and the Gauss curvature. Take a semi-geodesic chart S. Recall that this means that SU and SV are perpendicular and the V curves are unit speed geodesics. Let V denote the length of SV as a function of U and V. V is in general not a constant and is precisely telling us how far apart are the geodesics given by the V curves. Let's look at a couple of examples. In the flat plane, the identity is clearly a semi-geodesic chart and V happens to be constant. In the unit sphere, the map given by spherical coordinates is easily seen to be a semi-geodesic chart as meridians are unit speed geodesics. Here V equals sine of U, which is concave with respect to U. When we consider a surface of revolution, whose generatrix is a graph of a positive convex function, the standard parametrization is a semi-geodesic chart, and the function B coincides with the distance from the axis of rotation. In this case, the function B is convex with respect to U. So in the three simple examples we have analyzed, the function b u u is negative in the presence of positive curvature and positive in the presence of negative curvature. This is the content of the following proposition, also known as the Jacobi equation. It gives us an explicit expression for the Gauss curvature in terms of the convexity of b, which encodes how nearby geodesics behave. For the purpose of proving this formula, write uppercase x for the unit vector in the direction su and uppercase y for the unit vector in the direction sv. Notice that x actually equals su and y equals sv over b. Let lmmn denote the matrix of the shape operator in the basis x and y. It is symmetric because xy is an orthonormal basis and the shape operator is self-adjoint. The main step is to express the derivatives of x and y in terms of this matrix. We begin with xu. Notice that xu equals suu, which by hypothesis is perpendicular to both x and y. To find the normal component, compute suu.n, which by the product rule equals the derivative of su.n with respect to u minus su times nu. By definition, minus nu is the shape operator applied to su, so we get that xu equals ln. Next one in our list is yu. The product yu times x equals the derivative with respect to u of y dot x minus y dot xu. The first term is zero as x, y are orthogonal, and the second term is zero by hypothesis. The product yu dot y equals one half of the derivative with respect to u of y dot y. This is zero as y has constant length. The product yu dot n equals by the product rule the derivative of y dot n with respect to u minus y times n u. The first term is clearly zero as n is perpendicular to sigma, and since minus n u equals the shape operator applied to x, this last expression equals m. Combining these three expressions, we can write yu as mn. Then we compute xv. xv equals suv, which is the derivative of by with respect to u, which by the product rule equals buy plus byu. 
by our previous computations, this equals BUY plus BMN. The last term in our list is YV. By adjusting our orientation, we can write Y as N cross X. The derivative with respect to V of this expression is NV cross X plus N cross XV. For the first term, we write NV as minus the shape operator applied to SV and use the fact that SV equals BY. For the second term, recall that XV equals BUY plus BMN. Then the first term becomes minus VNY cross X and the second one VUN cross Y. Wrapping up, we deduce that YV equals minus BUX plus BNN. Finally, the Gauss curvature K is the determinant of the shape operator. Then BK equals BLN minus VM squared. The first term equals XU times YV while the second term equals xv times yu. We then rewrite each term using the product rule. The first one equals the derivative of x dot yv with respect to u minus x dot yuv. The second one equals the derivative of x dot yu with respect to v minus x dot yuv. We cancel the repeated term and then, by plugging in yv and xu from the above formulas, we get precisely minus buu, finishing the proof. This important formula will be used multiple times later, but for now we will use it to prove a classic theorem by Gauss. The theorem Gregium states that if we have an isometry between two surfaces, then it respects the Gauss curvature. In other words, if there is a smooth function from one surface to another with the property that the length of the tangent vectors are preserved, then the Gauss curvature is also preserved. The proof of this theorem is straightforward. Since phi respects the length of tangent vectors, it also respects the length of curves, meaning that it sends geodesics to geodesics, as they are the curves that locally minimize length. Therefore, it sends semi-geodesic charts to semi-geodesic charts. By the Jacobi equation, the Gauss curvature can be computed in terms of the lengths of vectors SV in a semi-geodesic chart, allowing us to compute the curvature on either surface with the same formula, giving us the theorem. This theorem implies that if we deform a surface without stretching or contracting, the curvature doesn't change. In particular, there cannot exist a flat map that does not distort the shape of the Earth, because the curvature of the flat plane is distinct from the curvature of the Earth. And that's it for today, hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.